Welcome back to Soccer 60. This is episode 7 of the Soccer 60 podcast where we bring in a youth coach or a expert in the industry to get to know them more and to dissect more about the industry as a whole. In And towards the end of the show, we'll be answering some of the questions from you guys, the listeners. So don't forget to follow us on our social media platforms, which is at Little League Soccer MY on Facebook and Instagram. In this podcast, your usual suspects are myself, Henry Chu, Andy Johnston, and today we have technical director of FC Kuala Lumpur, Gareth Davies. How are you guys doing? Yeah, How are we doing, mate? I'm good, you? Yeah, I'm doing fine myself. Andy, you seem out of sorts today. You okay? I'm fine, just hoping that you get through this episode without making a mistake, Henry. Oh, uh, <coughs> fingers crossed. Uh, I think I fluffed up a bit at the start, but no matter. Um, because the next thing I need you to do is to tell us a bit more about Little League this week. Yep, so as usual, we've got um, quite a bit of stuff going on this week. Um, we've got more from Coach Nidal coming. You would have heard in the last few weeks that Nidal is running our, um, our online training sessions with our Little League program. Every week, Thursday, it's a free trial class. Uh, Saturday and Sunday mornings, 9 to 10 a.m. Um, do give them a go. They're, they're great. He started this little program that he's calling the Mini Maestros. Um, so lots of technical ball work there, coordination drills. It's really fantastic. But we've also got a little bit more from him this week because he's the coach that's been nominated for the, the daily skills brought to you by Boost Juice. Um, so this week he is taking us through a masterclass of feints and turns and how to evade your defenders. So I'm looking forward to that. I think it should be a really good week of, of drills for people to pick up. So do get onto our YouTube channel and check that out. Um, we've also got a special video coming up from our FC Kuala Lumpur team. Um, we're putting together a video showcasing all of the skills that our, our young children um, and, and young players have picked up throughout this MCO period. Obviously, it's been a tough time for everybody, but we like to think that everybody is learning something. So we're putting together a little video to showca showcase um, some of the fantastic skills that our coaches have been teaching them. So look out for that. Uh, and then finally, following on from last week's topic where, where Coach Chris put together a section of um, top five tips to, to train at home. Um, we've got our, our coach Gaz, who's on today, taking you through the top five skills to master for every player. So that's going to be interesting to see how he's com combined those. So look out for that a little bit later on in the week. Um, as always, all the information on littleleague.my. Um, and that's about all the news from Little League this week. Henry. That's right. Then don't forget to rate us on our um, podcast abilities on your favorite social media, uh, on your favorite <coughs> podcast platforms. Um, rate us five stars if you enjoy uh, what you're listening to. And uh, don't shake your heads. Uh, <laughs> if you don't, uh, give us feedback, okay? Send me all the abuse that you want, as Andy has mentioned last week. Um, and as usual, we start off with explain that kit. But actually, today, I noticed in this call, something very different for gas and before we start explaining that kid gas i want you to explain what you're drinking because i saw you drinking something out of a bottle can, yeah, can, you, so explain, can you explain that please <laughs> yeah basically uh i was not feeling too great last week so um this week i'm basically drinking uh, lemon mint and honey water a uh, liter and a half just to get myself feeling back human again <laughs> so it's, a i've got a rainforest I've got, I've got a rainforest in my mug it's awesome <laughs> <laughs> no, guess it we tastes move. better than it looks. It tastes better than it looks. I, I, but I, I, I believe so. I believe so. So, guess explain that kit. Uh, so basically, as you can see today, uh, I'm wearing one of my old um, Everton coaching jerseys from uh, time in Kuwait. Um, basically, nothing fancy behind this. This is just where my coaching journey started. Uh, it actually started at Everton in Kuwait. Um, so this jersey really means really means a lot to me. This is this is the guys that gave me the foundation to coach how I coach these days. So yeah, basically this is where everything all started for me. So it means the world to me. Mm. That is a very brief explanation on uh, the kid. Do you en did you enjoy that, Andy? What can I say? Nothing lives up to Kesh's uh, story yeah. a couple of weeks ago. I don't, I don't think anyone's <laughs> ever going to beat that story. I, I, I think we're going to have to change this this topic because um, you know Kesh has just killed it for everybody. I'm afraid. <laughs> well, Simon got a sofa out of his kit, so half a sofa out of his kit, so that's great as well. Simon's story just reflected on the fact that he had to write in by postcard to enter <laughs> a competition <laughs> rather than sign up online or anything. So. <laughs> That kind of took away from the point of the story, as far as I was concerned. Yeah, and, and the fact that he got a Liverpool top despite voting for Man United. 
<laughs> and you're wearing an Everton top today, so everything's come full circle, isn't it? Not sad. Not sad. <laughs> Um, we will move on swiftly to the next topic, which is an introduction to Gaz's story. So as usual, Gaz, why don't you give a brief background yourself and how you got yourself into football? Uh, so basically, just for, for me, getting into football was really simple. My dad is absolutely football mad. Everything's mm-hmm. football for my dad. Um, he grew up playing in uh, the Portsmouth Academy as the goalkeeper there. Um, and yeah, from ever since I can remember, he always made sure I had a ball at my feet. Um, and I think that stems from his dad, from my grandfather. <clears throat> um, my grandfather was a professional footballer. So he played for Scunthorpe and he played for Portsmouth. Um, so sort of football's in the family. Um, I think there's quite a famous story behind my granddad as well involving Liverpool uh, at Anfield. I think he scored something. It was either he scored something like the first hat-trick for the away team at Anfield, or he scored two goals in five minutes in the cup against Liverpool at Anfield. And yeah, so football's always been in the blood, always been in the family. So uh, I grew up, I, I kind of had no choice. The, the old man gave me a football and, and that was it. I, I, think you, I think you made your, uh, a choice of your own, actually, uh, because you before going to football, you actually went to pro rugby, didn't you? Yeah, so, I mean, in my younger years, everything was football. Okay. Uh, I always played with some really, really good sides with some really good players uh, in, my, in my football in time. Uh, and then my parents actually moved to Saudi Arabia. So they moved to Riyadh uh, and they said, basically, you know, you, do you want to come with us? Uh, so I, I went off to, to Saudi. Uh, I was educated in uh, Riyadh for two years uh, in a private school there. Um, and as you can imagine, the standard of football and coaching in Saudi compared to UK at the time was immensely different. Mm. So all my friends progressed, they all improved, and I just didn't. Um, I sort of flatlined in my footballing. We went to Kuwait, um, and I actually remember sitting on the balcony uh, one morning having my breakfast, and we heard some air raid sirens, and we looked out across the Persian Gulf, and we saw the British and... Uh, American naval fleet coming in with George Bush uh, ready to sort of invade Kuwait so my dad phoned us up and said you're on the next flight out of the country get back to the UK so we was back in the UK for 10 years um, before moving abroad again but during that time I got back and I could see that I just my friends were far better than me at football and my dad was like look you've always loved rugby you've never had a chance to play why don't you go and give rugby a go go and find a local amateur club uh, and then a good friend of mine, Jermaine. Um, I grew up with Jermaine. Um, he's currently working at Man City. So I, I do a lot mm. of work with Jermaine. Me and him always have discussions about football and coaching and practices. Um, he said, come and join the local amateur rugby team. So that's how I got into rugby. I, I joined the local amateur rugby team at 17 to play for the under 17s. We played one match and we got beaten very, very heavily. Uh, it, it put the whole squad off. So nobody wanted to come back and play. And the coach at the time, Steve Creek, uh, an amazing guy, a wonderful human. Um, he said, look, we've got a men's second team. At 17 years old, you qualify to play for the men's team. Do you want to help the second team, anybody? Everybody didn't want to. And I put my hand up saying, I still want to play. So I went and played at 17 in a men's team. Uh, I was in the second team for a few weeks. And then the first team coach, uh, Mitch Stringer, he promoted me to the first team of the amateur team and I was fortunate enough because he was a pro rugby player he played in the Super League and at the time he was playing in the championship and it was him that got me into that path right uh, guess just for a second just going back to your time in Saudi how old were you when you spent those couple of years there oh that's a great question um I must have been about 13 14 maybe a bit less sort of 12 so I think that's I think that's a really interesting um uh, thing to examine uh, how you, those couple of ty- a couple of years spent out of well organized, well coached football at the age of thirteen, fourteen, fifteen um, made such a difference when you came back and you saw how much your friends had progressed, and it just goes to speak um, to our players how important it is to keep up with the game at that age, and yeah. you know the, the the effects of having uh, less competition, less less good quality coaching around you, how important it is in those formative years. Massively, massively important, um, and uh, yeah, I did. Uh, like I say, um, you are a product of your environment. You, you've trained at the highest level, and that's where I'm a big believer in. You're best off being the worst player in the best team than the best player in a, in a poor team, you know, and that, that was my problem. Uh, I went to Saudi, by far the best player in my school, 
and I just you just didn't learn, you didn't progress. You know, you mm. need to be around those stronger, better players to to help you develop. So, and have that right environment with good coaching and and things. So yeah, it did it. It held me back, but it gave me an opportunity to go and have a go at rugby and, and play rugby. Well, speaking of uh, development, you then transitioned off from rugby into football. What what made you go back to football? Um, first of all, love of the game. Um, our family's obviously got a big footballing tradition, right. I, and I always missed the game. So it was that was first and foremost. But I'll, I'll be honest, I was a bit tired of rugby. Um, I got tired of the game. I, I did it too much. Uh, I went from an amateur season, which was winter, into a pro season, which was summer, back into an amateur season, which was winter, back into a pro season which was summer and I basically went every weekend playing rugby and I just wanted a weekend off and, you know, but also like, in terms of my attitude as well, I think that's why I didn't quite fully make it at rugby. Uh, I'll be honest, I had a bit of a bad attitude. <laughs> uh, and that's where now in my coaching, I, I push hard on, on attitude and character. You can make all the excuses in the world of why you didn't make it as a, as a pro player. Oh, I injured my shoulder, my club went into administration but there's always a way around that um, and I look back now as a coach going I must have been a nightmare to deal with because I did have such a bad attitude I I did crave to go out on the weekends and things and you just can't do that so, so, um, so I just went back into football because I love the game and yeah basically I'd, I'd got a bit of a bad attitude in rugby <laughs> when you come across characters like that that you coach now who uh, remind you of your younger self does it um make you want to put an arm around them and say look i've been through this before uh this is what what you need to do in order to to get yourself out of this slump or does it make you annoyed that you see somebody else making the same mistakes that you made oh not at all no it definitely doesn't make me annoyed it's more the other one um and i think that's what happened with my rugby i, I had a bad attitude and it was more like a defense mechanism um i was very underconfident um, but I came across as this confident person. So I always just wanted an arm around me and I didn't know how to ask for that. So when I see these players now, um, I do. Um, in fact, there is, a, I've met a few players like that. Um, massive story was a guy called Danny Avakin uh, in Kuwait. He was an Armenian guy, all the talent in the world. He was fast, he was strong, he was quick. He was a lethal striker, had all the ability to go to the highest level, but he was same like me, poor, poor attitude held him back. And I remember at the club, you know, we put him on a scholarship system and he would, he'd miss his coaching sometimes. And the boss at the time would be like, we can't have this guy. He keeps missing coaching. He's setting a bad example. And I was like, no, we need to stick with him. We need to work with him. And I did, I worked very closely with Danny. I put my arm around him, encouraged him. He, he didn't have much school qualifications. He was a, he was a bad lad. Um, I managed to get him on a course and help him. We, we put him on a course to become a personal trainer. Told him he has to commit to his coaching. He committed to his coaching. Uh, he started to go on the journey of getting his badges. And Danny is a huge success story now. Um, <clears throat> Danny is actually now as qualified as me. And he's like half my age. <laughs> so mm. Danny's in his early 20s. He's got a UEFA B license. He's coaching pro in Armenia. Uh, and he's a fully qualified personal trainer and he's now getting a good successful salary. So it was a great story. Um, yeah. So is it, is it more rewarding for you to see that kind of story uh, with somebody that you coached or to see somebody go on and uh, fulfill a professional playing career? Do you know what? It's, you get satisfaction from both. Massive satisfaction from both. Um, you know, you see someone, some of your players go on to have a great playing career. Like one of the guys from Kuwait, he's gone on to Romania as well, Eid. Uh, he went, uh, uh, he's, he's only again 17, 18, but he's playing in the men's first team in the second division of Romania. And he got offered mm. a contract from the best team in the first division of Romania. Um, and he turned it down to continue playing first team football in the second division. You know, so again, massively proud of that young man and the work he put in um, and what he did. I'm, I'm a big believer in it. It's not you as a coach, right? It's, it's the player. It's the players a watch. And we're all just small little cogs and it's every cog that makes them the success that, that they are. But ultimately it comes down to them and their hard work and their commitment. And so, yeah, I, I was proud of Waleed for going on for that. Proud of Danny becoming a coach. One of my players, Dylan, he had, um, he actually had trials with Chelsea um, and could have gone on to, to go on and play at Chelsea. And he, he decided to sort of turn that down because he wanted to become a lawyer. And he said to me, he said, you always taught us, go for your dreams, Coach Gaz. Work hard, give everything you've got, go for your dreams. And he said, my dream's to be a lawyer. So he left Kuwait. He went to 
studying York and he's now a fully qualified lawyer and I'm just as proud of that as I am any of my football stories the fact that one of our players got encouraged to follow his dreams and he's now fulfilled that in becoming a lawyer so I think as long as we, we encourage these players to do that then, then we should be proud of that that's brilliant uh, that being said we're going to move in swiftly into the next topic which is um, your journey into your licensing your your getting your coaching badges um, we're going to develop more of the stories of players later uh, as we go on uh, further into the show but right now we just want to hear more about your uh, experience uh, taking the UEFA B license um, why do you decide to take it you know most of the coaches are usually content or, no, or that I know of at least uh, are content with a level 2 FA level 2 which is an equivalent of a UEFA C so what made you decide I need to go up to the next level um, yeah in terms of that I think a lot of people are content to just sort of obviously stick at that level 2 because I think it depends what you plan on doing in football coaching what is your career aspirations if you don't intend to take it upon as a full time lifelong career you, you probably stay at that level because you'll always be coaching at your grassroots amateur clubs um, and you've probably got another profession, yeah, you know, a teacher, engineer, whatever, you know. Um, whereas for me, I want to make football coaching my career. Mm. Um, this, is, this is my career. Th th this is it. And I think when you go into any career, no matter what that is, it's vitally important to get educated to the highest possible level you, you can. So I, I took the B license because that's that's part of the progression. Um, I want to get to that that next level and that next stage. And obviously, you, you, the higher the badge you've got, the the better chance of working opportunities you you create for yourself. So I wanted to do it for that, but also to gain that extra knowledge, learn more, and yeah, just grow as a grow as a coach. Uh, so basically. From what you have said, I'm going to skip ahead from uh, all the things I put in the rundown. I'm going to ask you this question. Uh, we had this discussion with uh, Coach Chris um, last week about coaching badges. Uh, what is your stance with coaching badges? Do you think it makes a coach a better coach or is there any other factors that you think? It, do you think it solely is the driving force of being a better coach or is there other factors that you think plays into it? Yeah, there's, no, there's definitely other factors as well. I think it's a balance. You know, um, obviously, we, we spoke a lot about experience and putting experience very high up there. And I agree with that. Um, you do need your experience for sure. That's, that's where you truly learn is out on the pitch. Um, but also, I think you need a mentor, someone to guide you as well. But you need those badges because those badges keep you updated and informed on the latest way to teach players and the best methodologies is so it's got to be a combination like you can't just say oh experience is truly better mm. having a mentor is the best or having the badges is the best i don't believe one of them single-handedly is if you only have one of them you're cutting yourself off from other options so i think you need a balance of of all those three because experience is wonderful but i have i've met people who's been coaching say 10 15 years in the game yep. they've not gone and done a badge they've done their badge not gone and kept up to date and you can see their coaching methodologies are now 10 years old they've repeated year one 10 times and you can see that the players don't relate to them anymore because they've been educated different and that's where these licenses come in handy so for for my license um, it only lasts three years after three years it's no longer valid unless i complete 15 hours of cpd so i have to go back to the fa um, you know, five hours a year and continue to learn. If I do that over three years, my badge is renewed and it carries on. So it keeps you up to date in what the latest methodologies in coaching are and how to relate to your players. So I, I believe if you don't keep your badges up to date, you soon fall behind in the latest methodologies, uh, which can be very dangerous. So I, I think you need a balance of everything and a mentor is huge. Mm. And, and I think as well, just just uh, adding on to what Gaz has said there, those, those three ways really of, of learning and progressing your trading mm. badges mentorship and experience i think obviously it's, it's key to have um all three of them but everybody is a different learner as well and some people are going to get more from the mentorship some people are going to get more from the practical experience and some people are going to get more from right. sitting on a course looking at a book and take straight away taking that out onto the field to to practice to practice and rehearse it and different people are going to pick up 
different things from from each of those methods and uh, I think that you have to understand that as well that there's going to be some individuals out there that might sit through um, a coaching course yeah. and it not really sink in but then they get out on the field and they practice that for three months and all of a sudden it, it clicks for them and they're like ah okay now I understand yeah. it um, and, and, and that's mm. that's very it, common so you like, also as, have to be aware and Chris that touched on last week, individuals are they, there is certain individuals who necessarily don't have well. that higher level badge but operate and perform at a higher level um, I mean my mentor the guy who was my mentor um, a guy called Liam O'Brien um he was an under-19s head coach, and he was a level two qualified coach. Before right. that, the under-19s head coach was an A-licensed coach. And so I, was, I went under this A-licensed coach as my mentor. And obviously, as you can imagine, I learned a lot from the guy. Liam came in, who was less qualified than this guy, but I consider Liam a better mentor and a, by far a better coach. And he was only a level two qualified coach. And I, I look at it this day, he's now running a, a sports program at the American University of the Middle East. Right. Uh, and an incredible, incredible coach. And a lot of what I learned is, is from him. Um, and he was just a level two qualified coach, but he just knew his stuff. And you could see his man management was incredible. So, mm. um, you know, it is, it's many factors that make that. I think another, th another thing to, to acknowledge is that, especially uh, at our level being in a private amateur club, you're going to see a lot of people that come into the coaching field that come into football coaching because football is what they know and perhaps um, study in the classroom didn't necessarily come naturally to them, you know, and, and they never wanted to follow that path of going to university and, and studying and, and going to get a, a regular job, so to speak. Um, and maybe that for them, being out on the field and learning practically is a much easier method than going to sit in a classroom to, to do a coaching course. And not that all co not that coaching courses are all classroom based, far from it. Mm. But there is certainly an element of being sat in a in a classroom and and listening to lectures and stuff. And that can be hard for some people. And and perhaps a lot of people that get into football coaching, like I said especially maybe at the, the lower amateur level, they're getting into it because they want to be out on the field. You know, right. They don't want to be sat yeah. in, a, in a classroom or an office. Mm. And, and that's where, like, when I did the B licence, uh, and fair play to them, that's basically what they said. They said, look, we don't want to keep you guys stuck in a classroom uh, because you don't work in a classroom. You're out on the pitch. So on the B licence, we spent more time out on the field, out on the pitch, because they said, that's where you truly learn, that's where you work, that's your office. Mm. So they did, they, they put us in the classroom as minimum as they possibly could. I mean, I remember days where we would be out on pitch non-stop playing for four or five hours, you know. Uh, <laughs> you know, your legs were just aching and, and hurting, but you, you, you pushed on through that. So that, that's where the B licence I found was great, because they had a huge emphasis on practical. They said you're doing a practical job and they put you out there, which was wonderful. And I, and I think that that's, um, that's uh, an area that the licenses have improved in over the years. I think like if you go back and, and you were to do a B license uh, five years ago, perhaps you would probably spend a lot more time in the classroom. Uh, right. and it's a lot more theory based. Um, if you compare like our own coaches, I, I know um, Nazarin did a, a C license um, with the AFC, I think two years ago I want to say it now and then uh, coach Vishnu who we've also had on the podcast did the AFCC license at approximately a year later the mm. two courses were vastly different right and, and and there's been a massive progression in in what they're they're teaching there and um, I think that 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 goes back to what Gaz was saying about how important it is to keep those badges up to date as well. It's not just about doing it and then sitting on that for a 10 year period. You've got to go back and see what the new methodologies that are being taught as well. And I think that you've seen a lot of progression in that over the past five, five, six years. Speaking of progression, how has UF, taking the US, UFIB license changed you as a coach, Gaz? I mean, that's a, that's a great question. Um, do you know, it's, I'm not quite sure how to answer that, how it changed me. I don't think it necessarily changed me. Mm. I think it just enhanced my knowledge and the way you sort of structure and, and conduct a session. Um, and again, where, maybe where it changed me is when I was younger, you have this belief that you've got to make it complicated. 
Okay. You believe that you see more cones on the pitch, it means it's a better session. And okay. that's where, when I went to the pro clubs, when I started working with the likes of Celtic and Everton and all, all these guys, you got there and it's the complete opposite. It's, and this is what the B licence was. It was, don't be afraid to do a simple session. Give them a ball and tell them play a game of football. Genius is in simplicity. The game is the teacher. You're just the guidance. So um, it sort of gave you that confidence, as, as the guys have spoke about. The licence gives you the confidence to go, I don't need to put down a million markers and loads of ladders and fancy equipment. I can literally just say, there's a goal, there's a goal, here's a ball, and here's a stipulation I'm going to put into the session. And you find that, that, that those, the more simple your session is, the more effective it is. Mm. So, um, yeah, it just emphasised that genius is in simplicity. So it did encourage me maybe to change a bit in terms of simplifying the work I'm doing. Okay. I think from, from my point of view, um, when Gas came back from, from the, the B licence, I think it um, definitely gave him a little bit more confidence in what mm -hmm. he was doing. I think it... Um, uh, gave him a lot of ideas that he wanted to go and implement and I think it made him uh, more ambitious and I think right. like he touched upon earlier about how he he has made a decision that he wants to make this his career path and you know when he went off and did, it, did his B license that's a significant step um, to, to getting up those those qualification ladders and I think he came back more ambitious came back with good ideas um, and that's ultimately what led to us implementing him as the technical director um, to use some of those ideas and that ambition to push the club forward which I know right. we're going to come and talk talk about in a, in a, in a bit more detail in a minute mm. but I think that from my point of view as, as his employer that's what he came back with from that B license. Um, mm. I don't know about what it actually transpired to look like on the pitch. His players would have to answer that. But um, from my side, it was more ideas, more ambition, and more confidence to implement those ideas. Now, now speaking of uh, genius and simplicity as well, uh, I, I fondly remember this uh, because I was still a wee lad. Um, in oh, no, he's going to talk in about the League, again. In, in the Little oh, League no. setup. In the Little League setup. In the okay. Little League setup, when I first started working here, I. I I think Gaz and I came in at almost the same time, um, was that Gaz then took his UFA B course and he came back and he did a sharing session with the coaches. Um, I'm very sure you, you remember yeah. this uh, as well. Uh, the one thing that picked me, uh, uh, that really piqued my interest was how you made it easy for your trainees as well to train in a, an environment. Like, like I, I take one small element, which was just you holding one or two balls um, two footballs and just overlooking the whole program and as a ball goes out you roll the ball back and say new ball new ball start again you give them basically no time for break when it's training and i and i and i did not see that in you before you went to the ufrb course um and that was the one small things that i thought that we could point out here there is, there is Coach Henry's thing. official yeah. analysis of your improvement as a coach, Gaz. Uh, but but like cheers, in terms cheers, of Coach Henry. in terms of that, like apart from uh, apart from everything else, um, on how you motivate your players and everything like that, uh, I I think giving coaches or giving players the environment to really work on as a coach, I think that's the most important thing as well, and that that you've brought back in. Uh, is something that you don't see a lot in the Malaysian football scene in the grassroots because you're you're taught to fend for yourself. So if the ball rolls out, the coach is not going to get for you. I'm not going to baby you. I'm just going to ask you to run and get the ball yourself. And over here is like, like you want to provide an effective training session, and these small things can go a yeah. long way in terms of getting an yeah, effective the, training the session. Yeah, you're right, mate. Like the one percent that was a big thing on the on the license. It's mm. it's the one percent that give you a bigger advantage. Like. Uh, don't underestimate that one percent. You know, if if you're too big to do the small job that needs to be done, well, congratulations, you're too small to do the big job. You know, yeah, exactly. so always do the one percent. And yeah, that little trick with just keeping a ball and rolling it in keeps your session flowing, keeps it intense. It's such a simple thing, but it makes a huge difference when you watch a session and a football goes out and the coach says, "Go and fetch it." Everyone stood around waiting for the ball to come back in and. You know, it, it can kill the session sometimes. Yep. Whereas yep. the ball goes out of play, you fire another one in. It keeps it going. And, and the big thing is, is the game's intense. Mm. So training needs to be intense. Like, th there's no other way. It yep. has to mirror the game. Yeah. The thing I like about that little anecdote there is how true that statement runs from teaching under sixes all the way through to your age group that you're talking about under 16s for your personal experience there, Gaz. Uh, I mentioned last week that 
when I when I get back out on the pitch and coach these days is to go and teach the under sixes. It's what I enjoy, and that's one of the the most important things you can do is just have a few balls ready uh, so that when the ball goes out, you chuck one back in. And again, you just want the under sixes to play all the time, right? Mm-hmm. You just want them to play and, and keep control of the ball and and have as many touches as possible. And if you are wasting time waiting for them to go and collect it back and, and, and get it back. Um, they're not going to get as many touches as you want. And it just goes to show how some little lessons run throughout football, no matter what age group you're, you're dealing with. And obviously there's going to be slightly different um, uh, goals to get out of, of keeping those balls running if you're doing it with under sixes versus under 16s, but still the same principles apply. That's what I love about it. Mm. Uh, that being said as well, uh, you've heard my view, you've heard Andy's view as well. Um, See, I made some good points as well, Andy. Uh, but uh, uh, I think how you stumbled on that one. Yeah, but but it still got something out of it. Anyways, uh, how do you think your coaches view you now? Um, how your fellow coaches view you now with a U F B license? Yep, we'd have to ask them, eh? <laughs> <laughs> but how um, do you think? How do you think they view you, or do you feel any vibe or anything like that, as compared to when you had the U F C or level two license? Obviously, there was a big interest. Guys were coming up, and obviously, UEFA is a big thing here. Um, UEFA is the highest form you can get. Mm. Um, no, no disrespect to the AFC. It's a great course, and it's wonderful. But at the end of the day, UEFA is the dominant force. UEFA is the highest form of badge you can, you can take. So uh, I just found that, you know, we, we're lucky here with the team of coaches we have. Um, we've got a great team of coaches who've got wonderful characters. And I just found they was more intrigued. You know, they would come up... Um, you know, oh, so you're doing your, your B license, you know, what, what is it you're doing? What is it you're learning? How do you, how do you do it? So I found that they just became more, more intrigued to see what's at that level, how it's being taught. So yeah, it was, it was great. You know, these things can go one way or the other, right? You can get somebody who maybe gets jealous of this, tries to attack it, okay. or you get somebody that comes in and is intrigued. And, and luckily in our team of coaches, everybody was just intrigued. They just wanted to ask questions about it, you know? Um, so it was more that really, more people just wanted to learn from my experience kind of thing, which was, which was really nice. Okay. Uh, before we move on, biggest lesson you've learned in the UFIP course, what is it? Oh, biggest lesson I learned. Um, I would say it would be, again, genius in simplicity and uh, humility. Um, be brave. Um, that was a big thing on the course everywhere. Be brave. Okay. You know, so I would say go and be brave in your coaching. Go and try things. Don't be afraid. Give it a go. See what happens. And um, the other massive one was self-reflection. I've not touched upon that. Um, they gave us a book where you had to write down what went successful. What did you find challenging? What three things would you implement different next time? Um, so, yeah, I would say that's uh, a big thing. Self-reflection. Go and be brave. Go and try something and then go and review it after because then the next time you do it, you can improve it. Just because it was a failure doesn't necessarily mean it was a bad thing. Yep. You, you can go back, review it, adapt it, tweak it and go, ah, now I found something that works. Um, so don't fear failure. Failure is a, a, a great learning tool. We, we learn more from his failures than we do our successes. So um, go and be brave, go and self-reflect uh, and that, that way you'll always grow. Quote that for uh, Gareth Davies, Davies 2020. Uh, we move on now <laughs> to the topic of the episode uh, where we ask a expert or a youth coach on a story that we want to talk about and today we're going to talk about a more personal piece which is Gareth Davies the technical director now it wasn't very long in your time uh, with Little League and FC Kuala Lumpur before you were appointed as a technical director for the FC KL Elite setup Um, could you give us in more detail your role as a technical director in the private academy Um, yeah I just I sit at home and do nothing (laughs) <laughs> no, no, I kidding. I don't think Andy wants to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, say, I, just, I just sat on my balcony having a cup of coffee, just thinking about life. Uh, no, um, massively changed. Um, yeah, I. Uh, what's free time? Um, you know, I, I tell my players, champions do extra, right? And yeah, in this role, I have to. It's, it's, people don't see what goes on in the background. Um, from the moment I wake up, my computer's on. Um, I'm working on things, as you know yourself, Henry, uh, and so does Ian. Ian probably really dislikes me. I'm always sending that poor guy really badly done documents. Just 
Ian's recording this call, by the way, so he's hearing everything. Yeah. <laughs> he's probably laughing now. He's probably sat there going, yeah, Gaz is right. You know, <laughs> uh, I'm constantly just writing out Word documents full of information and then sending them to Ian and saying, can you make these look good? You know, and, and obviously you've been working on these manuals with me. So it's a lot of the background work that people don't see. Uh, creating presentations. So creating, like I've been working on a language document mm. recently, a coach's language document. So it's... it's, it's more paperwork in the background that, that you don't realize you know setting those foundations and and those fundamentals and then not only that but the, the educational aspect of it of uh coming bringing coaches in providing them presentations giving them a structure to sort of follow and it's, it's all these things in 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 your spare time really that you know people think oh you sat at home you got spare time and yeah as a td uh, you, you don't get that anymore mate it's You've got to constantly be coming up with new, fresh ideas to keep your coaches inspired, keep them motivated. And again, you're trying to build a consistent platform, right? you know, of everybody performing at the best. So you're having to come up with different little ways and things that you, you can implement. Okay. Um, as compared to professional setup, like we, we, we know how, what a technical director works in a professional setup. How is it different um, to being a private football academy's technical director? especially in the grassroots level? Um, I mean, I, I've not been in the role in a professional mm. club to, to compare, so I, I don't fully know if I'm being honest. Mm -hmm. um, but what I would say is I try not to differ it. Okay. Um, at FCK, we, we, inspire to, we aspire to be the best. Um, and obviously, yes, pro and amateur, there is different, but if we can bring in that pro level, that mm -hmm. pro knowledge, and apply it to what we're doing... Then, then why not? Obviously, they have some advantages, like they'll get more contact time than we get with the players. Yeah. Um, they can do different work and things like that with that time. So you just have to adapt, you know, because they get so much time with the players. They have got time where they can put their players in a gym and let them have a workout. Yep. You know, whereas sometimes with us, we're like, we've only got an hour and a half, three times a week. Do I really want to pop them in the gym every week? Maybe I need to introduce it in a way where they go in there maybe once a month, once every two weeks. So we have to tweak and adapt to due mainly to timing. But at the end of the day, we, we're going to have kids in our academy that aspire to compete at that level. So right. we have to make that transition as smooth and as easy as we possibly can. So whatever the pros are doing that we can do, we look to implement that and put that okay. in there. So. I think I think as well. Um, obviously, there's several key differences between us and a pro club in terms mm. of the players, um, the players' abilities. Uh, the players' big one is the time they have to commit to training. Obviously, if they're a professional football player, they're not doing anything else other than playing football. So, if you want to see them in the morning for a, a light tactical workout, and then you want to see them in the afternoon for a, for a heavier conditioning workout they answer to you, they have to come in, right? Obviously we don't have the benefit of, of doing that. Um, but what we should also not forget is that every coach that coaches for us is a professional coach, right? By definition, they're a professional coach. They're doing this for a job, for their living. So there's no reason why their um, attitudes and their commitment and um, the seriousness that they, they approach their job with should not be the same level as we see in a professional club. Mm -hmm. And I think that what we're trying to do is we're trying to put into a, a structure into place with, with Gaz putting all of that into the TD role um, to ensure that coaches have a setup and a base to to perform as if they were in a professional club. Now, there's elements that they can't control within that, like I said, with the contact time of the players and things like that. But everything that is required of a, of a professional coach in a professional academy is also required in this role. We, we require that this coach to put in their 100% effort um, to be professional, basically. And, and from that point of view, there's not much different and there shouldn't be anything different from working at a professional club. Mm. Um, that being said, what is the philosophy and culture that you're trying to instill with FC Kuala Lumpur as technical director, Gaz? Um, again, uh, for me, it's sort of seeing what the, the pros do, pros do, seeing why they do that, and what's the reasons behind it. Um, I was massively, massively inspired um, by Celtic. I mean, you guys know I'm a, I'm a Celtic fan, so I'm biased. But working with them was was a dream come true, mm. uh, and it was just incredible. You know, you I, I met these guys that that really inspired me, like Michael McCahill uh, and Zeeshan. They they flew out to work with us in the Middle East. Just, 
Again, incredible coaches, incredible human beings. They've become very good friends of mine. And then we went back to Celtic to do their convention and, and learn from them. And their, their big thing was develop the person, then develop the player. It's, you know, it's more important to create a good human being because, for one, you look at the percentages. If you're a player and you're in, say, Man United Academy, mm. it's something like 1% of their academy players actually make it to the first team. A lot of these players in these squads go off to not actually be professional athletes. And that's in their environment. That's in a pro environment at, say, Man United. You know, um, so it's not a high percentage. So if, if we send a bunch of rude, arrogant people out into the world, have we improved the world? Have we made it a better place? And again, all it does is give a stain on our name. Mm. Um, whereas if we create good people first, these guys are going to go out, they're going to be great human beings, they're going to do wonderful work in the community, um, they're going to be kind, caring, respectful, um, and it's going to put a good name. Oh, FC Kuala and Lumpur must be wonderful. They're, everyone I've met who's played for that club has been a, a great human being. And, but the biggest side to that is it makes you coachable. Okay. Like, if, if you're, say, I don't know, rude, arrogant, you are not coachable anymore. So you could be the most talented player in the world. But if you do not want to listen and you do not want to work hard, that coach cannot progress you and move you forward. You, you will just stay at that one talented level. Whereas if you are humble, you have humility, you listen, you're willing to work hard, this coach can take you to another level. Mm. They can help improve you. So it's, it's be a good human first because then you become coachable. We can then work with you. We can improve you. So it's the philosophy here is develop the person, then develop the player. Um, and then off the back of that, our, our principles are uh, caring. Uh, you know, we, we want to create caring people. Um, respect. Be respectful at all times. Respect not just the coaches. Respect your parents. Uh, respect your peers. Things like this. Uh, integrity. Do the right thing. Not because people are watching. Do the right thing when no one's watching because it's the right thing to do. Mm. Uh, and last one is commitment. Um, so we base all our philosophy around these four things. Again, commitment. I've not met a successful person that spent more time on the couch than they did applying their profession. Right. If, if, if you want to be successful, you have to have a positive mind. You have to work hard. Be good with other human beings and this will help you progress and you've got to show up every day. So, um, yeah, we base everything around those, those core values and those core principles. And then off the back of that, I would say we look to develop creative, two-footed players that, that aim to achieve excellence. Okay. Uh, Andy, do you have anything to add on in terms of the philosophy and culture that Gaz has been trying to instill in FC Kuala Lumpur? No, I mean, like, that's basically the, um, the things that he came back from his UA for B with. And that was, those were the, you know, I think it's, it's lifelong lessons that Gaz has, has learned himself. And then going on that UA for B course, I think reinforced um what his beliefs were and it's the <clears throat> it's the kind of philosophy that pro clubs are, are now adopting you know right. if you were to go back 15 20 years ago i don't think those courses would have been giving out um such philosophical statements i think it would have been more about they must be in work hard um no no sort of outside of football care or thoughts about what might be going on it's about what what happens on the football pitch so i think that's changed a lot in the last 20 years and i think that what gaz probably found on that that uefa course was that it reflected his own sentiments and gave him the confidence to come back and say this is what we should be doing this is what i want to instill and it's something that resonates with me as well um it's the the kind of um, message i want to send out at the club you know the the vast majority of the players that come through fc kuala lumpur or little league are never going to play professional football so it's far more important for us to develop good human beings that can go out into the world and provide something uh, of value um in whichever field they may end up in and hopefully we can have played a part in a little bit of of them becoming a good human and a good good person and going to contribute something to society whatever field that may be in um, and that's it, it just resonates perfectly with my beliefs gaz's beliefs what uefa is teaching now um who are we at fckl to disagree with those kind of uh methodologies right uh, that being said uh, Gaz, I'm very sure that being a technical director here 
it comes with its set of set of challenges. Uh, what are the challenges that you've been facing since you've taken up the role, especially when it comes to parents and players? I'll touch about the coaches later, but what about with parents and players? Um, do you know what? I thought it would be a lot more challenging. Mm -hmm. um, I was expecting a lot more resistance because part of this philosophy is you're, you're, you're you know, telling people to go against what they've been told in the past. Okay. So someone's gone on this course and, you know, like me, they've been inspired. Uh, they did it, say, 15 years ago and it inspired them and they pushed on. And then someone like myself has now come in learning these, these, these methodologies and come in and said, actually, what you was told back then is actually the opposite now. So I thought it was going to be extremely difficult because I thought I was going to have to convince people, obviously, to go to the opposite way. For example, in the past, it was very much scold and instruct. Now yeah. it's question and answer because we want to develop a thinking player because we noticed that this scolding and instructing worked on the small pictures when kids didn't really have their own opinion and they could just play in fear and, and it had all work and it had all be nice. But then by 14, they'd develop their own opinion and they'd leave the game. They just leave the game and not play. So in the UK, we had the highest participants in football in the world at under eights. By the age of under 14, we also had the highest dropout rate in the world. And it's because of that methodology. So I've then, now they've created these new methodologies that keep players in the game, keep them learning, keep them thinking. So I came in going, I'm going to have to tell these guys to do the complete opposite. This is going to be so difficult. You know, uh, I'm telling them to go against everything they've ever known. So I was expecting a massive, massive challenge. And here, people's been really accepting of it. Mm. Um, it's, yeah, we've, like I said, we've had a great team of coaches that's just bought in. And maybe it's because of when I do my research, I go to the highest level I can possibly find. You know, I've gone around the professional clubs. Um, I've even done a lot of studying in my masters uh, based on New Zealand All Blacks, the most successful sports team the world's ever seen. So a lot of this has come from rugby. And the team team methodology that you hear me speak about came from my rugby, came from the, the Hoyland Vikings from my amateur days. And mm. it actually that filtered down from, from the pro clubs. You know, so a lot of that came from high levels in UEFA. So I think it was easier to get that buy-in. Because people were like, well, this is not just Gaz saying, this is my philosophy. This is me. This is what I believe. This is me saying, I've been on a course. This is what UEFA has told me. When I worked with Everton and Celtic, this is what they showed me. You know, when I studied the Old Blacks, this is what they showed me. So um, I, I think people backed it because I could evidence my research from the highest levels. So I didn't face as many challenges as I thought I would. You know, parents really bought into it. They loved the idea. And I think it's because they could see we was genuine. We wanted to inspire their kids and make their kids better. It, it wasn't some sort of self-egotistical trip. It was just a, we want to make your kids great human beings. Who wouldn't want to buy into that? Yeah, um, I, I, think as, I think as well, um, it's helped because a, a bit like what we were talking about uh, last week with Chris, um, about how it's difficult to get parents thinking that sport or football is going to be a viable career for their, for their young kids. Um, yeah. If we are delivering the message that, look, we understand that most people here are not going to go and play professional football. We're going to try and get them to play to the highest standard they possibly can. But realistically, that's not going to be professional football. But what we will do is along the way, teach them great values, teach them to be good people. Um, and when they leave us and go on to do whatever field uh, they may do in the future, they will have learned something by coming to FCKL or Little League um, that they can take with them. And when you do that, it's not difficult to get parents on board. Right. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. But yeah, so uh, the challenge hasn't been as difficult as I thought. Some of the challenges have been, you know, you think uh, I'll create this tool for people to use and I can get it out in a week. And three months later, <laughs> it's still not out. So uh, managing my time effectively there and actually setting realistic goals on when you can get this information out and timing your information when you send it out. Um, Challenge also executing your information. The way you present your information to get people to buy in is a big factor. Right. Uh, you could have a wonderful idea, but you present it in the wrong way. Um, you won't get so much buy in. So having to present your information in the right way uh, has been challenging for me to come up with that method. You do get one or two people that, that do question and challenge what you want to do. Um, you know, don't necessarily believe in it. And, you know, so you get challenged in that aspect sometimes, and that's okay. These people don't believe in it, and that, that's fine, but this is what we're doing. Uh, this is who we are, and this is where we go in. And your, your idea is to try and convert that person. They, they might want to challenge it because they don't fully understand it. Maybe they're a bit afraid of it. 
So uh, patience has been something that's been challenging for me because Andy will tell you, I'm, <laughs> my patience is not always the best. I'm, I'm quite fiery at times. I'm very passionate in what I do. And if someone doesn't follow it, I'm the first one on the phone to poor Andy having to go him, Andy, why is this? Why is that? I'm not happy. <laughs> you know, and I'm going off on this massive tangent and Andy's uh, he's wonderful at calming me down with guys. Chill out. <laughs> it's not the end of the world. <laughs> you know, so think- um, learning my patience and being a bit more understanding and going, okay, this person's done this, right. How can I, how can I work? How can I change who I am? And how can I adapt myself to inspire that person? They obviously learn in a different way. So how am I going to inspire this person? And that's harder with adults because adults are far more opinionated than players. Mm. <laughs> so, and especially when they're uneducated, <laughs> it's, it's very hard. So that, that's been a challenge. I think as well, like um, when people have been, uh, let's, let's talk about coaches now, right? If you've been on a coaching course that was, uh, you know, 10 years ago and it taught you something and that's the, the methodology. Like you say, you go back 10 years ago, it may have been more on the, the scold and instruct methodology. And now all of a sudden there's a shift in, in psyche um, to, to this uh, question and answer. Now, if you were already somebody that naturally liked to question and answer, it's going to be very easy for you to accept that uh, new methodology because it's like, oh yeah, I get this. It's in line with my thinking and, and it makes sense. Um, but if you're somebody that... Um, that that believed in that that scold and instruct methodology and you liked that at the time and now everything's developing to this question and answer method it's going to be an awful lot harder for you to adapt to it it'll be the same way that if in 10 years time for whatever reason the scold and instruct comes back in cycle it's going to be a a lot harder for gaz to try and adjust to that because it goes against what what he currently believes you know Mm. but that this is the job of of a coach is about developing with the times and there may well be something in 10 years time that is the new methodology that's accepted by UEFA that Gaz doesn't agree with right, right? and then we're going to see like are we able to adjust and, and change our personal opinions on it or are we just living in the moment because this is what we currently agree with and it's what's being being taught like that's that's difficult to tell you can never answer that question but inevitably 10 years ago there was people that that very much understood and, and accepted and agreed with the scold and instruct methodology. There mm-hmm. will be coaches out there now that are delivering that, believing that that's the best way. But it's going against what we are asking people to do because we're asking um, people to take on the, the the current UEFA philosophy. And for somebody in myself or Gaz's mold, it's very easy to get on board with that because it resonates with what we personally believe. Right. And so you always have to be understanding of people that have different views and, and different methodologies. And you know that's always going to be difficult. And mm-hmm. it can be coaches, it could be parents, it could even be players. You know, there can be players that are, are in the older categories, 14, 15, 16, that already know that unless somebody gives them a right, and I won't say the word on online, unless someone, gives them right, unless someone gives one a right one of those, <laughs> they won't work hard, right? So they, so they might prefer to go and seek a coach that is just on their case 24 seven, no matter what, right? Whereas there'll be other players that prefer a, a, an arm around them and a little bit of encouragement, a little bit of positive reinforcement. So there's no uh, one stop fits all for, for coaching. So yeah, I just yeah. I, I think that you know coaching is always going to be that there's there's going to be um, some people that prefer a different style, a different methodology. You see yeah. that with with professional players that move <clears> club, <throat> they get under a manager, they suddenly resonate with them and are the best player in the world. Yeah. Uh, they might get a transfer for a massive fee, go to a new club, new manager, new style of play, and all of a sudden they look like how is this player ever worth eighty million pound or, or whatever it may yeah. be. Yeah, um, right. And you see that all the time, and that's going to happen in amateur youth football as well. So it's it's always something to deal with. I just think that you know we've we've hit this this period where UEFA is is put out this philosophy where it's all question and answer. It resonates with us. It's something that we can put our brand out and say we are proud to deliver this style of football coaching. If you like it, that's fantastic. Come and get on board. If you want to find a, another coach that's a bit more up your alley in some other way by all means go ahead and do it it's not going to be for everybody but this is something that we feel very passionate about very strongly about and um we can put it out there and say yes i'm proud of this product that we're offering Mm. yeah i think that like you said that's what it's about isn't it? it's about being proud of what we're offering and and you know hitting that out to people but like, like andy said there it's this could all change again in 10 years time and that's why it's vital to stay up with with your badges you know i mean um, one of the things we 
you know, I, I was taught, and I think it comes down from the Marines, is it's not the strongest that survive. When, when you look at the world and there's a change, so when something changes, it's not the strongest that survive. It's not the most intelligent. It's not the smartest that survive. It's not the quickest, the fastest. None of those survive. It's the most adaptable that survives. And that's what they're taught in the Marines. Be adaptable. Your situation, your environment, your scenario is going to change. And if you don't adapt to that, you are going to be either left behind, you're going to fail in, in terms of range, you're probably going to die, right? You know, so you have to be adaptable. So I think that's going to be the biggest thing for us in the next step uh, is if something does come along that, that, that says, actually, we need to change again, uh, is are we ready uh, uh, to be adaptable? Um, adapt to your environment. And, and so that's, that's what we're hoping for there. Can we be adaptable in the future? Uh, speaking about adaptability, how tough has it been to balance your role as a coach and as a technical director and how different has it been coaching coaches as compared to coaching players now you're doing both yeah it's it's, it's more difficult than I, than I thought that was going to be actually I thought ah oh, it's easy you turn up to the pitch you do your coaching and then you do this bit extra on the side and yeah. and it is it's, it is very different obviously it's very demanding on you and, and I had to learn that you know you you don't talk to the, you don't educate the fellow coaches like you do a player it's completely different you know, you're, you're looking at your players that, that look up to you. They, they've come to play for you. Um, you know, they, they have their opinions, but they'll work for you. Um, but I find with coaches, they, they are more challenging because they have gone through an educational path. They, they are knowledgeable people. So they, they do want to, they are more opinionated and they will want to challenge you more. So when, when you're sort of dealing with these coaches, yeah, they're actually far more sensitive than the players. They really are. You know, co those coaches are sensitive human beings, you know, Henry. We're very sensitive, you know. So, yeah, you have to be more sensitive when you're working with the coaches and you have to gauge sort of on their experience and draw on their experience a bit more. Yeah. Uh, and you have to listen to their ideas a bit more um, and think about how you can meet in the middle. Make, if they've got a slight disagreement and they want to listen, you want to do that? It's about give and take. It's like, all right, actually, I see the perspective you're coming from. You're more this way. I'm more that way. Why don't we have to change it and meet in the middle? So you do have to give a little bit more. Um, you know, um, when, when you are trying to educate the coaches. So, yeah, that has been, that has been challenging. And, uh, yeah, I'm definitely learning a lot from that. I think be a, on, be that, more patient. On, on that line of questioning, like, it's important to note that um, Gaz was... Mm. A, a senior coach at FCKL mm. before he became the t technical director. That meant that he was was promoted to the technical director's role, and um, he was no longer uh, a coach. Yep. He was the boss of his peers that he had previously been been coaching with, and that's a very difficult position to be in um, because you know, no matter how much you try to stay uh, friendly and on the same level as the rest of the coaches. Everyone's always going to see you now as, as being in an elevated position. They're going to look up to you for answers, for um, you to lead by example. And everyone makes mistakes. If, if you get elevated above your peers and then you make a mistake, they're going to be the first to let you know about it or they're going to be questioning you or they're going to be doubting you. Yep. And that's a very, yep. very stressful position to be in. Um, and if we just go back to the comparison about how this role is different from being in a professional club, this is something that would very unlikely uh, would be very unlikely to happen in a professional club where there was a coach promoted to a technical director's role from within the club. Nine times out of ten, they're going to be an outside appointment that comes from a previous technical director's job from somewhere, gets made the technical director, and, and the coaches are accepting that there's a new technical director in, this is the direction we're going to follow now. Um, when you get promoted internally, it's very difficult to, to deal with that change in relationship. Yeah, and, and changing where the line is, and it is, it's very difficult because there's certain things that, as a coach, you could sit there and be involved in, then you become technical director, you're like, I don't want to hear this, so, you know, or like, I can't seem to be involved in this conversation, I'm going to have to walk away, uh, you know, and obviously I have those scenarios where like, I don't agree with what you're saying, guys, this is not right, I've just dealt with this same issue from another party, and now you're bringing it up now, like, really, no, right, I suggest you stop it and I'm pulling myself away. And sometimes your actions there speak volumes to the coach. The fact that you've been their peer that would maybe get involved in that has stood up and gone, sorry guys, I'm out. You can see that they soon change and they soon stop talking about that topic like, oh, 
you know so sometimes your actions uh, can speak more volumes and, and that's been hard learning that line to separate now that actually guys look I, I'm here I, I have to pull myself away and be a little bit more distant uh, Andy will tell you I'm a very sociable happy positive touchy feely sort of guy like, I like to give people high fives handshakes hugs you know and then you become the technical director and sometimes like these people I've had to sort of distance myself away a little bit from the other coaches you know before when they used to go out and say, let's, we're finished training, let's go out and grab a bite to eat, let's all go out. You could go to every single one of those as the coach. But then I soon learned that now I'm technical director, I'm only gonna go to a few of those now and then. Because you found you'd get at everyone and everyone would just be on you. Why aren't we doing this yet? Why aren't we doing that yet? And you're like, guys, I've been doing a job five minutes, give me time, I can't do everything at once, <laughs> you know? <laughs> but like, one thing at a time, and there's things in the background that coaches that I didn't know and I didn't see it, it was like, ah, oh, that's why I can't implement that right now. That makes total sense why we've not been doing it. I have to wait six months to implement this. So you develop more of an understanding because once you're sort of in that management area, you start to understand the background technicalities that actually stop something mm. that from a coach's perspective looks very simple to do. As a coach, I'm like, why aren't we doing that? It's easy, we should be doing that right away. And then you, you get technical director and you're like, Andy, why aren't we doing this? And then he tells you and you're like, oh, Right, yeah, that makes sense. I fully get it. You know, but everyone else is running around at this meal, raging. Why aren't we doing that? We should be doing that. And you're like, oh, I can't share the information. There's good reasons. Just trust us. So in the end, you, you sort of distance yourself away and you find that you only go out once a month just to create that, that little bit of distance so that you do get a bit more respect. Mm, mm. Now that being said, with you and Andy working together on a certain philosophy and how you want to structure FC Kuala Lumpur, um, where do you s hope to see what do you hope to see in 10 years with FCKL and also Little League in whole? Uh, for me in 10 years, mm. uh, I just want to see growth. I think we, we're doing really exciting things at the club. I'm very excited to be part of the club. I'm very proud to be part of the club. Mm. And uh, I just want to see this program now spread out and grow. Can we reach other parts of KL? Can we reach other parts of Malaysia? Can we, can we expand, you know? Mm -hmm. So I'd like to see that growth. Um, and same in terms with, with our coaches now for me, is I want to see our coaches grow, get better, get extra licenses, you know, uh, and see the coaches go on to their next licenses and, and understand our coaches' dreams. What's their aspirations? Do they want to grow with the club and become management roles within the club? Or do they want to grow and go and be a pro? How can we help and inspire our, our coaches to, to grow further? So I just want to see growth from our coaches as individuals bringing their ideas and growing in the direction they want to grow in and how can we support them in that. And then I just want to see the, the this philosophy now that we're executing, because I believe in it, can we expand it out? Can can we grow in terms of, of that really and, and hit more people, hit more players, hit more parents, mm. you know, and, and pass this philosophy on to, to, to more players and help inspire more players here in Malaysia. Can we inspire more young Malaysians to, to come and get involved on this program and can we watch them grow as people and, you know, grow on to do great things? So, uh, yeah, I want to start hearing success stories from our players, success stories from our coaches and us grow as a, as a club, get bigger, expand. Well, here's to hoping and Here's to um, getting there in your structure and hopefully your philosophy as well in the future. Here's to putting a sentence yeah. together, Henry. Uh, <laughs> hey, that was really inspirational. I'm trying to. P I'm not. I'm just trying to piece myself together. I feel broken right now, <laughs> hearing that. Uh, we. That being said, we are. Was it very to inspirational then? Yeah. No, no, no. no. Okay. You know, that's, 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 how, that's how. I. That's how I react to something. Sometimes you know you need to break a little inside so you can get some space for new things. Yeah. Um, to, to be fair, Henry is for people that don't know Henry. He is an emotional guy. I he am is an emotional guy. Yeah. Yeah. We will. We will not talk about that <laughs> here in this podcast. <laughs> because we're going to move into the <laughs> final segment <laughs> of our yes, podcast We got him, today. we got him, we got him. <laughs> we're going to move on to the final segment of the show where we give we, we take questions for Andy and Gaz, my favourite part of the show, which is called Ask Soccer 60. Andy and Gaz do not know what the questions are, only I do. If you have any questions for our future guests, do not hesitate to send them over on our social media platforms, which is at Little League Soccer MY on Facebook and Instagram. Now, Without any further ado, I will ask you a question from one of our coaches. And of course, without any failure in sending in <laughs> questions, Simon Motika is sending a question. Yeah, there we go. Uh, 
Has there been any coaches that have inspired you along your coaching journey? And it does not necessarily mean it has to be a pro coach, guess. Yeah, great question, Simon. Thanks, mate. Um, yes, massively. Uh, I mentioned earlier on in the podcast, uh, Liam O'Brien. When I was assistant at the under-19s, he was, he was my head coach, and that guy inspired me beyond belief. Uh, really looked up to him. Wonderful, wonderful coach. So he was an inspiration, was Liam O'Brien. Uh, Stuart Gribbin. Good friend of mine, he's now based in China at the moment. He came to see me in Malaysia uh, beginning of this year before COVID. Uh, again, wonderful inspirational coach. Um, very positive in the way he works. Has unique ideas on the training pitch, you know. Where coaches would look, use colours, he would use teams. And then he would use their stadiums. So he was right. all about generating a really thinking play. So you couldn't just, you know, for example, show a red marker. Uh, and go, oh, red. He wasn't red, it was like, he would shout out Anfield. Because Liverpool wear red, and you'd have to like, oh, you know, you. So he was a great coach. He inspired me a lot. Uh, Michael McCahill and Zeeshan, the guys from Celtic, who came out, um, they worked closely with them. They're massive inspirations to me. Martin Miller from Celtic, he runs the youth program there. Uh, the single best human being I've ever met in my life. Um, yeah, the ex, uh, you know, is I'd actually run away with Martin. Martin Miller, he's he's incredible. Um, so he inspired me a lot. Uh, Learned a lot from him. Um, so yes, yeah, so guys like that really inspired me. Uh, Mike and Baker, my former bosses, mm -hmm. they always encouraged me to learn, go and be better. You know, get on these courses, go and read books, go and do things. So Mike and Baker inspired me a lot. Uh, what about what about uh, Andy Johnston? Oh, man, it, that guy's a he's, a he's a bit dodgy. He's a bit dodgy. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No, no. To Andy, Andy's right up there. You know. Um, Obviously, like in terms of this now, Andy sort of took me under his wing. I'm, you know, Andy is my current mentor right now. I'm learning from Andy, so yeah, I'm learning a lot from Andy now because he's teaching me the difference between being a coach and now going into that management role. That's a transition that Andy went through. So, uh, as Andy will tell you, um, he, I think his wife might be concerned because uh, I speak to Andy more than because yeah. I'm always on the phone to him. So, yeah, Andy's my mentor. I'm learning a lot from Andy. So, yeah, Andy's definitely someone who's up there that, that inspires me now and I'm on my next phase of my journey learning from Andy. So, yeah, there's been a lot of guys that's inspired me out there in, in terms of my coaching. There we go, Simon. Uh, next question will be from Francis Gills. Would you have rather been a player or are you happier as a coach? Oh, coach all day of the week. Don't even have to think about that one. Uh, I, have to, I, I tell people I've got the best job in the world. Um, you know, I, I loved playing, don't get me wrong, I enjoy playing, mm -hmm. um, but I get very nervous before the games, and that was always one thing that I struggled to manage, and um, that adrenaline, so yeah, in terms of playing, I would rather coach all day of the week. I'm sorry, do you, still, you, do you get nervous, do you get nervous before games when you coach now? Ah, yeah, yeah, I still get nervous before games now. Uh, you know, because you just want your players to do well. You want, you, you know, you've been working hard. You've seen the effort they've put in. You just want them to represent themselves to the level you know they can. So I, I get nervous before games, but at least I'm not running around on the. Uh, do you, do, how do, how do you uh, stop your your nerves transferring to your players? Is that quite easy to do, or? Yeah. Um... Oh, yeah, I yeah, yeah, I do. Honestly, first sign of madness as well, that first sign of insanity. <laughs> I, I have blown conversations with myself. Um, but no, I do hide it from my players because you are the leader. And if you look nervous disposition and it doesn't inspire your players, they see you're nervous. It only makes them more nervous. So, yeah, you have to give this confident, strong persona. A way of managing it is a long time ago... Um, my, my ex-coach, Mitch Stringer, I, I, I did have that conversation with him like, at rugby. I was I always get nervous before the games. And he was like, nerves are a good thing. It means you care. It means you want it. This is your body telling you you are ready and you are going to give everything because you care. So I sort of tell myself that. That's probably what you see me saying to myself, talking to myself. It means you care, guys. It means you care. Come on. you know. Um, and then from the book from Dan Abraham, Soccer Tough, taught me control the controllables. Why am I getting nervous about that guy across from me? I can't control him. He's going to do what he's going to do. But I've got to find things that I can control to stop that person. So it might be my scanning and my communication. So I try to control the controllables, you know. Um, but I get nervous purely because I, I, I care a lot. I know how hard those boys have worked all week. I've seen it on the pitch. I've pushed them hard. I've made training intense. So you just don't want them to go out there and let themselves down. You, you want them to go on and represent themselves 
in the way that you know they deserve to be represented. So, yeah, I do get nervous, but I just love being coaching. Um, and even as a kid, I would always sort of teach the younger kids. I'd always try and help them and say, oh, come on, let's practice some shooting and things. So I think I've just always had that natural caring and leadership in me to, to teach and coach. So I know it was my bad attitude that was the reason why I didn't make it as a pro rugby player. I didn't go all the way because I had a poor attitude. So that's why now I'm big on attitude. I'm big on caring, big on giving people a shot uh, and just inspiring people like, don't make the mistakes I did. If I can make one person better and change one person to skip what I did that actually goes on to make it, it's, it's the best feeling in the world. You know, giving is always better than receiving. So when, when you see that, it's, it's, it's the job that you inspire every day and not many jobs you get to do that. Um, the final question, because uh, we have really good quality content for the past hour. Um, and I have, unfortunately, we have to cut this uh, segment short as much to my sadness or dismay uh, last question where do your ambitions lie as a coach developing grassroots players like at FCKL or progressing towards pro and adult teams um, good question at the moment I'm just so focused on what I'm doing here to be honest mate um, and I, I am enjoying what I'm doing here um, so for me my, my next stage is I want to get on my A license uh, I want to mm. go and get more knowledge I'm hoping to do that uh, on the next year's next year's course Mm -hmm. um, so I'm hoping to get on the A license and grow my knowledge in terms of a coach that way through my educational thing and like I say Andy's my mentor at the minute so I'm constantly looking to learn off Andy and draw off Andy uh, and, and to transition into that I'm actually enjoying coaching coaches at the moment um, and seeing them improve you know when, when you see when I look at the coaches who when they came in on day one to where they are now uh, it's really inspirational. So I just want to focus on how I can coach the coaches more uh, and continue my journey here learning as a, as a technical director for now. Um, I love working with grassroots players because they're so raw. They really appreciate it. So I, I am enjoying working in the grassroots sector, but you never know what the future holds. Right. Uh, at the moment, uh, as far as I can see, I want to sort of dedicate more of my future to FCKL and what I'm doing here and stay here for a long time. I said Malaysia would either be a two-year or a 10-year journey. I'm going into my third year now, so... <laughs> Uh, I could see myself here a long, long, long time. Um, so that's the way I see it now. However, why would you not want to be a pro coach and go and test yourself at that level as well? Just so yeah, you know, you I originally came here for two years as well. Yeah. <laughs> this is now my 20th year. Uh, just, just so you know, I've been here for about 27 years. So if you guys are... <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. Andy, any final words um, for, for this topic today? No, I'm just glad we got to, to talk a bit to, to Gaz about his um, philosophy and what he's trying to to implement at FCKL. Like I said, mm. it's it's um, he came to me with a, a good vision for the club and something that really resonated strongly with me. Um, I'm very happy with the work that we've done over the, the last 18 months or so. Um, I think the club has, has vastly improved uh, in a number of different ways. Um, I'm pleased to see Gaz taking on the... Uh, the change from coach to coach manager, or player manager almost. Um, that's not an easy change for, for people to make. Uh, I think he's enjoying it. Um, it's not an easy path to take, but I think it's it's one that um, Gaz is, is, is cut out to do. Um, so I, I look forward to seeing what the, the next couple of years brings in terms of what we can, can achieve. I think that the, the members in the club will have seen a big difference over the last 18 months, but... Yep. I think as far as we're concerned, we're just kind of scratching the surface with what we want to achieve. So hopefully in, in two, three years time, we, we sit down on and reflect on this podcast and we can't believe some of the things that we were talking about and uh, you know what position the club was in then because I hope that we are, are vastly different in two to three years time and yeah. just constantly striving for that level of improvement and that more um, professionalism. You know, we're not going to, we're not a professional club. We will never be a professional club, but we can present ourselves in a professional manner. And I think that's our, our goal. And that's it. That's the, that's the end of our podcast. Uh, we leave it on a very optimistic note. Here's to hoping as well. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. Um, yeah, thank you guys. Don't forget to give us feedback. Uh, send us some of your questions. We'd love to hear from you guys. Remember to just follow us on our social media platforms, which is at Little League Soccer MY on both Facebook and Instagram. Um, Rate us five stars on your favorite social, uh, podcasting platforms. Uh, do send in your comments as well uh, on what you think we can improve on because we love to hear from you guys about that as well. Um, 
most importantly, well, that's about it. Uh, stay tuned next week. We have a coach set up and lined up for you. So stay tuned. Stick around and look for our so- social media news and also on our website. Until next time, this is Soccer60. See you guys in the next episode.